Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live Q&A on the SBA Paycheck Protection Program. If you're joining us for the first time, we meet twice a week to discuss all recent news regarding the Paycheck Protection Program as of late. It's become heavily focused on getting your PPP loan forgiven. So that's where we will primarily focus today with our conversation. But if you have any questions at all re related to anything regarding the Paycheck Protection Program, you can simply chat us or answer, uh, put some questions into the Q&A and our internal experts, Seth Nelson and Justin Ridgely will be able to answer those questions. As you know, we also asked for questions beforehand. So we will be going through a handful of the questions we received prior to this webinar, as well as some of the questions we were unable to answer last time. But before we jump into questions, we'll be going over any updates to the program that have happened in the past few days. So Justin, I will let you take it from here. Thanks, Meredith. Let's skip ahead to uh, one of my slides here. Okay. So there have been, uh, you know, some more rumblings and mostly news updates, nothing you know, substantial uh, from the SBA since the application for forgiveness was released last Friday. The, uh, you know, the main thing that I have on this slide right here around today's updates are, you know, in the last even 48 hours, we've seen, you know, uh, politicians from, from both major parties uh, you know, focus more on changing PPP. And this is, you know, the main thing as we've talked about before in these webinars and that, you know, makes is kind of the biggest deal right now for borrowers that have, have taken PPP uh, is the, you know, potential lengthening of the eight week covered period window. So, uh, you know, I have a couple updates here. Yesterday, you know, we were hearing uh, from Nancy Pelosi that, you know, Basically, instead of trying to pass this, you know, CARES Act uh, 4.0, you know, which there would be a lot of negotiations and could take longer, uh, you know, instead of including PPP revisions in that bill, you know, okay, we, we, we now understand that this is a bit more of a time crunch and we need to figure this out sooner. So let's strip PPP revisions out into a separate bill. Uh, you know, at the same time, you know, you had Marco Rubio and some other, you know, Republicans and Democrats in the Senate say, listen, the clock's ticking here. Uh, we need to get this done. Uh, Rubio has been saying now he even wants to try to get a vote on this today. Um, so, you know, definitely some increased focus from Congress. And we had Secretary of Treasury Steve Mnuchin uh, on uh, in an interview uh, earlier today, uh, just a couple hours ago, you know, basically saying, okay, we're working with Congress. There's bipartisan support on lengthening this eight week period. Uh, he did say to only to extend it to potentially 10 or 12 weeks. Um, you know, obviously the requests from various industry groups have been 24 weeks. And, uh, you know, there's an also talk about getting, you know, lowering the 75% payroll threshold as well as, you know, moving back the June 30th uh, safe harbor date. Um, it looks like now, you know, based on everything, all these things I just kind of mentioned that it's highly likely that the eight weeks gets extended. We don't know till what, but it seems like there's, uh, you know, there's motivation from both parties and, in addition to not knowing how long it will, would get extended to potentially, we also don't know when. Uh, it's looking like maybe the Senate will, they might not get something done until next week, you know, after Memorial Day, you know, I'm not holding my breath on how quickly they move, but it does look like we've seen some increased urgency from politicians on both sides, you know, in this week so far, and hopefully something happens more quickly. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, the main updates here. We, we don't know anything for sure, and I think, you know, we'll try to in these webinars keep hitting on this and cover any of these developments, but it's nice to see politicians finally realizing that, you know, we are deep in the eight week period for most people who've taken PPP at this point, and these things need to be figured out sooner rather than later. So with that, there, there's no uh, other, you know, updates that we received from the SBA. I think, you know, I, I think Meredith, we can just go ahead and jump into questions. I know we've, we've got a number of them and you know, if you've listened to one of these webinars before, you know, we, the deck is here. There's a lot on you know, how to forgiveness works. We've covered it. And I think we can just kind of go into questions which may be more instructive to hopefully answer multiple people's questions at once through various answers. Absolutely. I, I, you bring up a couple of good things there, Justin, is we do send out the deck after every webinar which has a lot of the general information. If you find yourself having a question, 
And also while some of the questions being asked might feel like they're specific to somebody's situations, when you take a kind of zoom out a bit, you see that in many cases, it probably does also apply to your own. Uh, we have a ton of questions, so I'm glad we have ample time to answer them today, but I'm also looking forward to, sounds like in the next week's webinar, we might have some, some um, additional updates that could be quite exciting. So we'll definitely keep you posted there. But to go ahead and Meredith, jump right in, oh, sorry. Can I, can I jump in for one sec? We got a question in the chat around kind of the lengthening of the period. I just wanted to clarify real quick, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. So yeah, someone asked, um, you know, if this period gets lengthened, does that mean you need to keep employees on payroll for more than the eight weeks to get our loans forgiven? If so, would we get more funds to cover those additional costs? Um, you know, the interpretation I think that we're looking at right now is that this wouldn't be, uh, there would be no more funds, at least as currently envisioned, uh, in that you wouldn't have to necessarily uh, keep people for longer, depending on how they work out this, this FTE reduction or something like that. I think the goal of it would, more, would be to give people more optionality as to how fast they have to spend it. I think a lot of the concerns they're trying to address through the lengthening is people not being able to spend it on payroll enough because their businesses aren't open. I think you know if you our business is open and you're paying people normally, then I would anticipate that you know there that money would run out after eight weeks, uh, and then you pretty much that would that would be it. You get your loan forgiven. As far as then what happens if like you know you were doing this in the hopes that the business would reopen, it doesn't, and you have to then lay people off. That's a, a you know a scenario which I think we'll have to see how they address that with the rules. But anyway, just wanted to jump in on that one while it was live, kind of. Yeah, great catch. All right, so first question, um, for, for participants who have employees who are earning over $100,000 a year, which is a reminder, uh, in terms of your average monthly payroll, you could only count up to $100,000 in cash comp for any employee. How would somebody handle payment of those salaries to ensure they're within the rules of forgiveness since there is a cap? So for that one, um, essentially like you don't have to uh, pay people less if they're making you know, annualized over a hundred thousand dollars. That cap just applies as to what you can get forgiven. So, you know, if someone is paid, you know, the cap uh, that I'm going to point to on this slide right here, you know, is 15,385. Uh, you know, that's how much someone max that they could apply uh, salary towards forgiveness or so it's not about how much you can pay them total and you don't have to pay them less to meet that. It's just like if you pay them, you know, 20,000 total in two, two months, uh, you can only get 15,385 of it forgiven. Got it. Hopefully that, hopefully that clears that up. Yeah. Uh, and we have a participant who got the funds mid month, uh, but rent is typically due at the first of each month. So can they pay both June or July rents and still be considered to fall within the eight week time period? Yeah, so this was, this, this is a good question. This was clarified in the application that came out on Friday. Basically, they, they, the SBA has established this concept of not only paid, but incurred costs. So in this case, you know, I think what it's saying is, you know, you received the, the PPP loan on say like the 15th, the rent's due at the end of the month. So you pay that one rent. Uh, then, you know, the next month comes around, um, you know, you get to the, towards the end, I guess. And like you have a cost that falls within the eight weeks, but the bill doesn't come till actually after the period ends. The way that works is, you know, as long as like, if you have 15 days that, that you're incurring rent, meaning like half of the month, but the bill doesn't come for 15 days until after the eight weeks, you are allowed to include, you know, at least that, that half a month portion uh, in the PPP forgiveness amount because it was incurred during that period. And it basically, you know, they call out uh, in this loan, in the application, you know, if you incur it and you pay it on the next bill date after the period ends, that's still okay. Uh, what that doesn't mean though, is that like, if, you know, my period ends on uh, July 15th, my bills on, you know, July 31st, I can't, get forgiven the period of time after that ended, what you would get forgiven is essentially like half that rent you pay on that next bill because it's half the month covered in that eight weeks. Great. For, um, in, the, in this case, somebody is an owner, they have W2 employees, 
can you prepay bonuses to your employees or yourself to help maximize the loan forgiveness? So this is one where I've, I've had a few questions in, in different webinars about. Um, there hasn't been any specific guidance as far as, you know, accelerating bonuses. Um, you know, I think it's like a weird situation, potentially if, you know, you have a sales team as an example that's on a quarterly payment, but, you know, their bonus is being earned or incurred in each of those three months preceding. And, you know, your, the larger payment falls within your eight weeks. Are you allowed to count that whole amount for forgiveness, even though, you know, the beginning of that bonus period was, was before the eight weeks? Um, or, you know, the other example is, could you pay, say, you know, okay, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to meet this 75% or I just want to take care of my employees more. Uh, let me give them a bonus that maybe it's what I was going to give them at the end of the year paid now. We don't know what the guidance is there. I, I think, you know, the safest interpretation is that if it wasn't earned during the period, you shouldn't pay it during the period. And I think like in the case of an annual bonus, you can make the argument for like, if your annual bonus is, you know, 12,000 a year, don't pay the person 12,000, pay them 2,000, because that's, you know, represents the two months of the covered period. I think that, you know, is the safest assumption. However, um, you know, there's no official guidance there. We're not quite sure. What you can't do is, you know, uh, say you're, you're basically like booking, you know, accrued bonuses and then not paying those out in cash till later in the year. That violates the uh, having to pay out the cash for anything incurred on the next pay cycle rule, which was established. But as far as like a lump, lumpy, you know, salary or, or bonus or, or a commission, there has, there's not specific guidance, but I think that, you know, it's not beyond the realm of imagination to think that the SBA and Treasury <laughs> might not look kindly on stuffing large bonus amounts in the PPP period. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got this question in a, in a couple different ways, shapes, and forms. So I'm going to ask it uh, a bit generically. But for those, uh, those uh, participants that are independent contractors or sole proprietors, that they're essentially their salaried employee, or, and they use their Schedule C uh, in pro net profit to determine their, their average monthly payroll, um, how do they prove out the amount of payroll that they can pay themselves to determine the loan forgiveness? Yeah, so the, this is included here. I, I'll, I'll use my pointer again. Um, on this section that's on, on the Schedule A of the application, there's a line nine. Uh, and this is explicitly called out, you know, for owner employees or self-employed individuals, you know, what you can pay yourself. And, you know, yes, they took a, a bit of a, a you know, a kind of conservative approach here. Where they said, you know, you have to take the minimum of two amounts as the most you can pay yourself. And the minimum is, you know, the lesser of uh, the equivalent of 100K a year uh, or 15385 or uh, your eight week equivalent of your applicable compensation in 2019. So basically what, what you know, we're interpreting this to mean without, I think this could be clarified a little and and this is, this is my judgment and how it reads in the application. I'd encourage you to read this line nine for yourself, but it says, you know, if, if you take this rule and you say, okay, if it's the minimum of that, well then if I made under a hundred thousand dollars in 2019, then my average uh, for that eight week period will be less than that 15,385. Um, so you have to take a lower amount. Now, if you made over a hundred, you take the 15,385. So essentially what this, the bad thing about this potentially is like if you pay, if you were, you know, earning, um, you know, more, uh, I guess, in the beginning part of this year, then you may not make as much as you did previously. Now I do want to call out that, you know, this is for um, self-employed and owner employees. I think, you know, there's some, uh, I think there's some, kind of murkiness around like if you're a W-2 employee uh, of your own business, you know, you may fall into the first area. I think owner employee seems to cover that, but we haven't totally uh, gotten, you know, clear enough definition on that. But I would, I would encourage you to kind of think about it in that way. Um, 
you know, read that line nine language and then uh, kind of see what makes sense. It's, it, this one's slightly murky, like I said, and I don't want to take too strict of an interpretation here. Thanks, Justin. For uh, somebody who, if they receive the funds and they're not used in entirety at the end of the eight week time frame, what happens? Do they return the balance? If they, can you say that one more time? I, if I make sure I understand. Uh, for somebody who's they've received the funds, but they they won't be able to use them in it in their entirety at the end of the eight week time frame. Do they return the balance? So, uh, the if you can't use all of your funds, like if you can't meet, you know, the seventy five percent on payroll, for instance, and you're not going to get the loan fully forgiven, you can still. Uh, retain the balance as a loan uh, and spend it, you know, over a longer period of time on these categories. Or, you know, you can just say, okay, I, I was only able to get, you know, forty thousand out of my six or out of my eighty thousand dollar loan forgiven. So that's the, the free portion to me. Uh, I don't want to have a one percent loan on my books, so I'm just going to repay that amount. Uh, to the bank, that's allowable as well. You can repay the loan uh, at any time you want. There's no prepayment penalty of any kind. You will have to pay, you know, the accrued interest there on any portion that is not forgiven. So, meaning if you have an eighty thousand dollar loan, forty thousand is forgiven. You have a forty thousand dollar loan left. There will be a small amount of interest, you know, uh, from that period when received to when repaid. The idea is that if you can't, you know, of the lengthening eight weeks is that, you know, if you're worried about you can't spend, you can't spend enough on payroll in that time period because your business is, you know, has no demand or is shut down, uh, then by lengthening, hopefully you'll still be able to get it fully forgiven, just use it over more time. So that, that's one consideration, you know, right. why people are hoping to get this period lengthened. The other thing I wanted to add, just uh, on the back of what Justin shared there, is that you know, there is a six month deferral period that's automatically included with the PPP loan um, from the date of the uh, disbursement. So if your loan was dispersed on say May 1st, 2020, um, you, and a portion of your loan is not forgiven or you're not able to spend it all within the eight weeks, um, as Justin mentioned, that becomes a term loan for two years uh, at 1% interest and in that example I gave, you would not actually start making payments against that until November 1st or six months later. So um, that's, that's a benefit as well. But you should note that during that, that six-month time period, interest is still accruing. Great. That must have um, been clarification. So. In terms of applying for forgiveness, do you apply directly with the SBA or through the lender? In this participant's case, their lender was Bluevine. Justin, I think you may be on mute. Yeah, sorry, I was, was, was muted there for a sec. Uh, you do apply through your lender. The SBA is not accepting, you know, applications directly. Uh, and in some cases, you know, your lender may have uh, sold the loan to another party. Uh, you know, hopefully this isn't the case as it may make things a little harder or someone else may be servicing it. But, you know, either way, this will be on the lender uh, to process these basically to the SBA in the same way that you dealt directly with the lender uh, on the application process. Right. And we have a handful of people who are in a place where they're, they're receiving their funds, but they, they haven't opened up yet. So in this example, somebody's a travel agent. Um, there are still no, mostly no flights from airlines until July. They're not going to probably reopen until June 1st. So does the eight week period start from the day they receive their money or from when they're able to reopen as a business? So the eight week period can start uh, one of two ways, um, but you don't have that much control. So going to this slide here, um, essentially, you know, you could either, the eight weeks either starts from the day you receive your loan uh, or this concept of an alternative payroll covered period uh, which essentially says, okay, 
you know, we recognize that it might be easier to align this eight weeks with your payroll period. Uh, so what we'll do is establish this concept where, you know, if you uh, run your payroll on a biweekly, meaning twice a month or more frequent basis, like essentially, you know, if you run payroll twice a month and you receive your loan on a Monday, but your payroll is on a Friday, you can start your eight weeks on that Friday to align with your payroll. Those are the only two things you can do. You can't pick a later date to start. Um, you know, you either have to go with basically that next payroll date or the day you the funds are dispersed to your account. So this is again gets to why uh, you know we want to see you know, the government lengthen this eight week period because you basically have two options in this example. You know, you could uh, pay employees now to essentially you know not not work. Um, and then when you go to reopen, you know, you're not going to have as, as many funds left to make that last longer when they actually do start working, you need them to. Um, or hopefully, you know, you have a loan and it gets pushed to 12 weeks or eight or 16 weeks. And then you can actually, you know, hopefully, okay, then if I receive my loan May 1st and instead of eight weeks, you know, which kind of cuts off four weeks, if I open on June 1st, I can, you know, pay basically two months still from June 1st. Uh, through the end of July uh, and still be in that covered period. So that's kind of why, again, we want to see this eight weeks pushed out, um, but you can't, you know, pick a date beside those two constructs that I just mentioned, mm. start your period. So going into some specific asks of what counts for forgiveness, is, is, is medical insurance something that can count towards payroll costs in terms of forgiveness? Yes, it is, uh, but it's important to clarify that just it, it must be the employer paid contributions. So, you know, what this means is, you know, typically the health insurance plan, you know, a lot of times the employee will have something deducted from their salary or, or wages uh, that, that pays into the plan, then the employer, you know, pays their portion as well. And it's only the employer contributions. Uh, that can be counted towards payroll. The other items that can be counted is the same type of concept for retirement is if, you know, you're doing a 401k match or something like that, uh, you know, that contribution from the employer, not the withholding on the from the employee is what counts uh, towards payroll. You also have, you know, it's salary wages, tips, uh, commissions, it's uh, leave except for FFCRA leave uh, and also any state and local taxes, like a common one you see is a state unemployment tax paid by the employer. That is also can be counted in this payroll component since it's essentially something you have to pay as the employer when you run payroll. And just to build off of that, Justin, the, the health insurance would be above and beyond that 75% of the um, payroll requirement for forgiveness, right? So the the health insurance would be considered a non-payroll cost that uh, can go into that 25%, correct? Or am I wrong on that? I, I'm fairly confident it's included in the payroll amount. Okay, so that is part of the 75%. Yeah, these are what the, on the application are listed as the, as the parts of the payroll. The, not, the specific costs listed as non-payroll are, are these costs here which is mortgage, uh, mortgage interest, uh, rent, and utilities. We have a few questions. I know we had a question on utilities, Meredith. You want to cover mm -hmm. that now while we're here? Yep. So in particular, this person asked Comcast, DirecTV, sewer charges, water meter charges, and trash. Are those considered forgivable? Uh, or what is the definition yes. of utilities, really? So what they've defined it as is electric, electric, gas, water, uh, transportation is a little unclear, uh, telephone, internet access. Uh, I'm not sure about sanitation. That hasn't spe been specifically called out. Um, I think there is another one, direct TV. Uh, I think, you know, that's a little, I guess if it's, I don't think that would classify as a utility based on this definition. But again, there are a lot of edge cases here, I'm sure. Right. Um, so we're getting some, some specific questions around how hours are working here. So there's four payroll periods in the eight-week period. 
but in this particular scenario, that's netting out to more than 40 hours per week. So are they eligible to claim all the hours that they're, they're paying out for in those eight weeks or does it need to be just up to 40 hours per week per employee? Um, not sure I totally understand the question. I, I, think, what, I think what we're getting at is, uh, actually I'm not quite sure how to answer that one. I guess, you know, if you're paying out the equivalent of over 40 hours per week due to the, the length of the months. Um, I don't think that matters as much as the dollar amount you're paying out uh, unless we're talking about getting into the, the full-time equivalency uh, potential reduction in forgiveness if you've reduced those you know, full-time equivalent employees. Um, I'm not sure how else how to answer that. It's not completely clear to me. That's okay. If you submitted that question, if you could provide some additional clarification, that would be helpful. Um, but moving on to the next question, Justin, we actually asked, um, somebody had a clarification regarding benefits uh, as they're counted towards the 75%. If an employee earns $100,000 more a year, are the benefits counted on top of the, the eligible amount for that eight-week period or are inclusive? So the $100,000 cap only applies to cash compensation. So theoretically, you know, if you had an employee that was earning more than that and, you know, you're trying to figure out what, what is their payroll cost you can count towards forgiveness here, it would essentially be 15385 plus whatever the employer paid for retirement, uh, health care, and state and local taxes. And that, so it's not, the 100000 cap only applies to the cash comp not the benefits and taxes that were paid on behalf of or from the employer on behalf for that employee. Great. So we have a participant who fired an employee for cause and will not rehire and had a few employees that quit from the first quarter. How can they work around the percent penalty for salary reduction? So I'm just going to repeat this just to make sure I'm hearing this correct, that if, so, if the employer had employees quit and now they have less employees and they're worried about the forgiveness reduction clause, correct? Does that sound right? Can you repeat that, sorry? Yeah, it seems like what we're saying is that the employer had you know, employees that quit and mm -hmm. uh, now they're worried about the full-time equivalence reduction, correct? Correct. So, okay, I'll, I'll go to the slide, but that, that works a few ways. Um, so let me just go here real quick. So if you uh, had employees quit, uh, that's fine. Those won't count against you because as you go to the fourth bullet here on this slide, essentially, the SBA has made some exceptions to this potential uh, reduction in, in full-time equivalent employees. So one of these is voluntary resignation. Uh, so if, you know, obviously you can't, or, you know, my opinion is you shouldn't be held liable for this and SBA agrees where if you now say, okay, in the covered period, I, you know, ended, uh, with six employees, but in the reference period, I had 10, but four of the difference is four quit, uh, then you won't be penalized for that. Uh, you also won't be penalized, you know, for other things like this. If you, uh, laid people off, tried to rehire them and they turned down your offer, you also won't be held liable for that, but you'll have to prove that, uh, right? You said the documentation in your files for proving that uh, down the line. Uh, there's some, a few other cases here where if people voluntar voluntarily requested reduction in hours, um, let's see if there's any, yeah, I think it talks about a good faith effort made to rehire people uh, and rejected. Yep, so these are the main, oh, fired for cause is the other one. You know, if you, you aren't expected to retain an employee you would normally otherwise let go uh, for, for cause, uh, and that won't penalize you if you've done that uh, for this kind of potential reduction based on full-time equivalents. Awesome. So we're up on time. Um, I'm going to end us with one question for you, Seth. We have some people, it sounds like they're still looking to apply for PPP loans. Uh, we have somebody who's trying to find a bank to submit a PPP loan application to, as well as somebody who's curious how long that process takes. So can you provide some advice on where to go if you need funding and how long you can expect the process to take? Yeah, absolutely. So 
there is still um, over a hundred billion dollars actually that is available for PPP lending. So you can definitely still apply and get access to the funds. Um, you can apply right now through fundera.com slash PPP. And we've got uh, a number of different lenders on our platform, uh, both banks and non-banks. Um, one of those is Bluevine uh, that was mentioned earlier. And they are actually able, they, they've been able to uh, really approve and fund loan applications within uh, about a day. So the process can move very quickly. Um, you, you can also apply locally through your, your local community bank or where you have an existing banking relationship if you have one. Um, PPP is available through uh, all FDIC insured lenders. Um, and then last thing I would say is that um, if, you are, uh, if you are looking to apply for PPP directly through a bank, then we can help you do that as well at fundera.com slash PPP. Or like I say, you can, you can work directly with your uh, existing bank relationship. Wonderful. Awesome. So we're up on time. Thank you everybody for joining us uh, for our PPP Q&A today. Uh, we will keep these going as long as there is appetite to have your questions answered. So we will follow up with these slides as well as the webinar recording if there's any information you wanted to dig further into. And please try to submit your questions beforehand prior to our webinars next week that will be on Tuesday and Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Thank you again as always to Justin and Seth for taking their time uh, to provide us with this information and I hope everyone has a, a lovely holiday weekend.